Welcome back to part two of the show. We're gonna look at how to set up your Final Cut timeline to grade the vlog footage in HDR. Good morning and welcome to part two of today's Photo Justice Photo Moment. One of the first shows we've ever done, we're breaking it into three parts. The first part was all about GH5S high ISO performance. We looked at how to set up the camera for shooting properly in high ISO, and we looked at some resulting shots both in good light and studio light and some sample shots from my blacksmithing project. We also looked at grading those on a standard dynamic range timeline, an SDR timeline, which is what you would normally do for any normal broadcast or YouTube work. But of course, we have the ability now to edit in HDR, high dynamic range. Now you have to have an HDR TV or an HDR phone to be able to see this. And honestly, exactly how you, how you set everything up so that it shows up in HDR and what devices, like on an, H, like an iPhone, I'm not, the iPhone's HDR I don't think works on YouTube, which is a problem for me because I'm an iPhone user. Uh, but we'll get to that another day. For now, we're just talking about how to set up the actual Final Cut project. Uh, it, it's not hard to do, but it is definitely not obvious. Before we jump in, let me see if there's any questions I want to hit up from the last, uh, from the last part one. Um, Jason was asking, can you get the same results, so what we saw here, with the GH5 with VLOG enabled? So if you're shooting VLOG on the GH5, you will still get the same results in the sense that you're going to have that flat file that you can grade out and make it look as beautiful as you want. But of course, you don't have the high ISO performance. So the GH5S, I was shooting these test shots that we're going to look at again here, all at 2500 ISO at the base high ISO. On the GH5, you would not be shooting at, if you're shooting at 2500, you'd be shooting at a lower base ISO that's gaining up, so it wouldn't look as clean. This, of course, is the advantage of the GH5S. And I think Frederick says these shots are hot. <laughs> you're funny. Uh, and Jake needs a GH5S, I completely agree. And Thomas asks, what ProRes setting do I use? I'm just using the default 422, so not the HQ, not the light, and certainly not the full 444. Just the standard default 422 ProRes is what I'm shooting at here. Okay, let's take a look at the Final Cut project again. So this is the SDR project we are looking at in the previous, uh, in part one. Now you can see up here, I've just I've named them. This one's called SDR. This is the HDR project. So here's the thing. Let's just, let's just start from the very beginning. So you're going to create a whole new library. And you do have to create a new library to work in HDR. You cannot have a library that is a standard library and then do an HDR project in it. The entire library is either SDR or HDR. This is probably one of the first kind of places you go, why can't I figure out how to turn on HDR? I see where the color profiles are changed, but I can't change it. It's because the entire library has to be set that way. So when you set up the library for the first time, unfortunately, so there's new library, it asks for a name, but that's it. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go temp and hit save. And that's it, there was no option. There was no, hey, do you want an SDR or HDR? You have to create the library and then go in and change it. So here's how you change it. So uh, the library is selected up here, you see this my one, it's called temp. Over here on the right-hand side, library properties are up. And if you've already done something in the project and that's not there, it is, um, where is properties? I forget the keyboard shortcut. Library properties, there we go, it's under file, and then library properties, control, command, J. That brings up this properties window. You click on modify, and it brings up one option, one choice. Do you want to work in standard or wide gamut HDR? This is what you have to change to be able to do an HDR project. If I don't change this, let me cancel this real quick. I'm gonna hit Command N to make a new project. You'll notice down here, I've got my color space, standard rec 709, but I can't actually change it. There's, I can't do anything there. Okay, so let's cancel that, go back into the, project, uh, the library properties, change this to wide gamut HDR. And now when I create a new project in here, now I can change the color space. I can go from standard rec 709 to wide gamut rec 2020, or wide gamut HDR at Rec 2020 PQ, or wide gamut HDR at Rec 2020 HLG. Okay, so now right about now you're thinking, that's fantastic, what in the heck is the difference between those? Believe me, there's much more information about this that I don't know than what I do know, but here's my base understanding of this. The PQ includes HDR10. HDR10 is the closest thing to a standard that we have. Every TV that does HDR supports HDR10. This is kind of your basic default, easy to do. HLG is actually what the GH5 and GH5S can shoot natively internally, which is cool. So if you want to shoot HDR, you don't want to grade it, you just want to shoot something and then upload to H as HDR and go, you'd shoot it in HLG, you could drop it on an HLG timeline. But HLG was designed more for live broadcast because 
HLG includes both the high dynamic range and the standard dynamic range, the HDR and the SDR feed in one. So you can shoot, let's say you're shooting a football game, broadcasting a football game live, you could do that in HDR, but then anybody who's watching it on an SDR screen would see, still see a good image. They're not gonna see something that should be HDR that's all clamped down and looks crappy. It's gonna look proper. So that's what HLG is for. So for the most part, if you're shooting V-Log, you wanna go into the PQ setting. If you're, um, if you're shooting HLG, on the camera, then you should go into the HLG setting. Although even that said, I think you can still put that on a PQ setting. That's part I don't really totally get, but those are your options in here. So if we're gonna, we would set this up to PQ and away we'd go. So that's how that would be. So that's, I've already done this. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this temp project now because I don't need that. Let me close that library. And I'm gonna open up this blacksmithing HDR version of the project that I have here. Now this one in here, Let's uh, see, if we open this up, there we go. This has all the same shots that you saw in the previous in part one, but these are now on an HDR timeline. Again, if I take this timeline here, hit Command J to bring up the properties of that, you can see, oh good, ha, huh. it didn't, it, I have no idea why that's there. We're gonna switch this over to HDR 2020 PQ, hit OK, and now this library is set up for that. Excellent, this project rather is set up for that. Fantastic, okay. Double check. Oh, that was the test. That's the wrong test. That's why it was the wrong one. This is the actual one we're working with called Blacksmith down here. Let's bring that up. Double check that one. Okay, I am losing my mind. There we go. Now we got the right one. Okay, starting over. Sorry about that. We're in the HDR project. You know, what? I should just close out this SDR one just so I can't get confused by that. That would be a clever thing to do. Okay, now we are. There's my Blacksmith test. There's my test project. Command J, double, triple check this thing, Rec 2020 PQ, we are good to go. Excellent. So now here's the stuff on the timeline. Let's close out these browser windows. You'll notice an immediate huge difference in the scopes in here. Instead of going from zero to 100 IRE, this is now actually measured in nits from zero to 10,000 nits. Now 10,000 is a, I don't know if I should call it theoretical limit, but that's the max of the spec. I don't think there's anything out there, any TVs or anything out there that go that bright yet. Um, most are, I think the kind of guideline is stay under 4,000 nits for now. But, uh, but again, that's part of this whole voodoo sauce that I don't totally get quite yet. But here's some cool things about working in this space. So we can see the shot essentially as it was before. This is, let's see here, I believe this already has the LUT, it must have the LUT applied to it already. Um, where are we, camera LUT? Oh, it has none. There we go. Well, let's just, let's select all of these shots uh, something tells me I've got a LUT. I do have a secondary LUT applied. There we go. Let's just, apparently when I copied this over this morning, that half terabyte copy that I had to do, I neglected to clean the project up. So let's just remove all attributes from this, remove everything. There we go. And now we're back to default. Okay, so there's our basic file without any LUT applied. Again, you can see how flat it is, just like we saw before from somewhere well above zero up to somewhere well below 100 in there. And if I take those shots, let's just select all of them, go back into the inspector and add the camera LUT. We're gonna add that Panasonic V-Log LUT. Now we have that beautiful look on there. Now there is something funky happening at the bottom on here. And that is something that we are going to talk about in the next video, which is my conundrum with the Atomos Ninja Inferno. Because of this, I'll explain what's happening to as best as I can in the next video in part three. But because of this, we're not gonna actually apply the LUT this normal way. We're gonna apply the LUT as a secondary LUT, which gives us the same result, but in a different way. So let me undo that. I'm going to just grab one of these shots, go to my effects browser here. I'm gonna search for LUT, custom LUT. That's the one that comes with Apple. Oh, with Final Cut, the supply LUT is a third party one that I had from before. So that's legacy for me. I'm gonna grab this custom LUT, drag it onto here and go in and set this secondary LUT as Panasonic V-Log. There we go. So now we're back to where we were before. I'm gonna copy that, select everything on the timeline, minus that one, Command Shift V, paste that LUT on. So now we've got that same LUT applied to everything. So now let's go for a shot that I might wanna grade. All right, let's say this is the shot that I'm gonna work with in here. As I go into my grading, before anything above 100 was gonna be clamped. But now I don't have to worry about that. I can take my highlights, let's start by taking the shadows down, take my shadows down, and I can take my highlights up and up and up and up and up, and I keep going, keep going, keep going. Let's pull the shadows back down. They're getting stretched out on there. And I can make for what amounts to a very, very bright color area in here. Now, on my screen, what I'm looking at here and what you're looking at there is a clamped image because this screen, your screen, this YouTube broadcast is only SDR. So you can't actually see 
the HDR results of it. You have to have an HDR monitor hooked up to it to actually see that. So that's not going to be on your Mac monitor. In theory, you can use this as an HDR monitor. I haven't gotten that to work. I'm going back and forth with Atomos support about that right now. So that's kind of a weird thing that I don't know why that's not working, but I haven't gotten that to work. In theory, you can use this Ninja Inferno as an HDR monitor. We'll leave the theory part. We'll leave it at the theory for now. When you're looking at it in Final Cut, though, you're going, well, hold on a second. How am I? I don't, I can't possibly see what's happening in here. I've just done this big grade on here where um, there's all this weird clamping happening. Let's, uh, let's say, like, this shot here, I'll grab this shot, do the same thing. If I bring up the highlights where I look at the scopes and nothing's getting cut off, let's take this all the way up to 4K. Like, nothing's getting cut off on there, right? But if you look at the image, it is quite obviously being clamped in here. So here's the funny weird thing that you can do inside Final Cut, open the preferences, so command comma to open the preferences. And I do not know why this is buried in the preferences. This seems like something that should be a big checkbox right at the top. Don't know why. But if you open the preferences, you have a checkbox here that says show HDR as raw values. This will give me a preview of this image as a raw value. So I don't see the full effect of my grade, but what I do see is all the values. See, all that flame data has now returned. This has nothing to do with the final output. This is just for the preview on the screen. Because I cannot grade on here in full HDR because it's not an HDR screen, this is something you could do where you basically are going to grade by looking at the scopes, but looking at a flat version of the image. It's odd, but that's how that works. You really want to have an HDR monitor if you're going to do HDR editing. Otherwise, you don't get to see what your final project actually looks like, and that could be a problem. So that's how you set it up in there. It's pretty straightforward, uh, but you do have to set up that library as a separate HDR library, high dynamic range library, and then set up your project with the right color space, and then off you go. And now when you go to export this, oh, hey, let's just do that real quick. If you go to now export this, let's say I just, I'm going to use the built-in share to YouTube it is going to show me under the settings that it has automatically picked the wide gamut Rec 2020 PQ color space. So remember, YouTube can do HDR with the right color space, with the right color TV. You can see it. Um, I don't have an HDR TV. The only HDR screen I have is my iPhone 10. And I, like I said earlier, I don't think it works with YouTube, which is super crazy annoying. Go Apple. Anyway, so that's how that is. So that, that's everything I wanted to do on there. Let's take a quick look at the comments, see if there's anything here we want to address, and then we're going to jump over to part three of the show where we're going to talk about the Ninja. Uh, let's see. Crazy About Fishing says, is the GH5 a better choice than the GH5S for handheld shooting with a telephoto lens? Most likely yes because of the built-in stabilization. I shoot outdoors often dawn and dusk, so like the low light but can't often use the tripod. Okay, so there's, there's your trade-off, right? The GH5 has the built-in stabilization, which is phenomenal. It is a really, really good stabilizer. But you have this camera, the GH5S, that has much better low-light performance. Hmm, what's a guy to do? If you have to shoot handheld, and you, you know, you, so you can't use a trap, if you have to shoot handheld and you really want this camera, yes, with by adding a, an optical stabilized lens to it, you are getting some of your stabilization back. You can always put the camera on a gimbal. Right now, I don't know if that works for your shooting scenario, but a handheld gimbal on there is going to do wonders towards bringing all of that stabilization back. It'll actually do more, better stabilization than what you would get just off of the built-in on the GH5. So if you have the capability to shoot that way, then a handheld gimbal with the GH5S should give you a more stable image than the GH5 handheld on its own with stabilization turned on. Your mileage may vary. It may not be possible for what you're shooting, but that's something to consider. Uh, Trevor says, do you have access to an HDR monitor so you can actually see your 2020 colors or you're just using the Inferno? So currently I do not have an HDR monitor. All I have is this, which again, I haven't been able to configure to preview HDR, which I'm waiting for Atomos to help me with. We're going back and forth on this. Everybody's confused on this one. There's a lot of confusion happening right now. Alexander Hogdahl says, you should get in touch with Alistair Chapman. I went to a course he had on HDR and he is using Atomos on his Mac for HDR monitoring. Oh, cool, he mentioned some software he was using. Ooh, excellent. Ryan, please write that name down. I will look up Alistair Chapman after the show. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, okay, cool. Let's move on to part three. Assured Creative Media says, have you seen or heard anything on the DJ Ronin S? DJ, no. Oh, the DJI Ronin S. No, I haven't used it yet. I'm trying to get my hands on an ICANN gimbal. Um, one of the cool things about the ICANN is the rear motor is angled so that you can see 
you can leave the viewfinder that way and still see it as opposed to having to open it up because the gimbal's in the way. Uh, I'm trying to get my hands on one of those. We'll get one eventually. Um, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll get one. I'll be playing with those soon enough. Uh, okay, all right, that's that. So that's that part of it. Now that is part two. I remember part one was all about the GH5S and its shots. We just looked at how to take those into HDR here in part two. In part three, we're gonna be talking about the Ninja Inferno and some really, really weird stuff that is happening in there. We'll be right back.